wow, I never expected this many people to show up. But then again, for a topic this phenomenally important, um, it is appropriate and fitting. So thank you so much for coming. I'm Congressman Tim Murphy. Uh, there will be a number of other people we'll meet as we go on here. Um, some we invited, uh, many of you came, but you heard about this uh, either through a mail or an article in the paper or perhaps on radio or television. Uh, some of you are professionals, some family members, some concerned citizens, educators, whatever that category is, we thank you for being here. This is not going to be a question and answer session where you're going to ask me questions that I'm going to tell you the answers. We're here because we need some answers. Uh, with a very serious problem in America, a very serious problem in Pennsylvania, a serious problem in southwestern South Pennsylvania, a problem that has reached deadly levels and a grave concern. But it's not new to us. Uh, it's, it's been growing, uh, and it is concerning all levels here. So it's appropriate that we're here as a community. I'm going to go through a couple of things to lay out some general ideas about like this, uh, about what we're dealing here with the drug problems and the deadly drug aspects, and perhaps some information you are not even aware of. So I want to set some informational background here so you have this. So we're going to open this up for a while uh, and, and go forward. Uh, we're going to have, I think, we have a paper that they want to ask questions. Yes, we have uh, distributed some cards. Some cards? Uh, I'll walk card. around the room and collect them. So what happens if you have a comment or something and you want to speak, you'll pull up the card, we'll pull it up, and then we'll have the microphone to you. Again, this is a, this is a dialogue among many people in the community who are all deeply concerned about what's happening. And uh, we want to be solutions-oriented. Uh, I just have to be brief and focused on it. But let me start off by saying a couple of things about it, give you a little background here. Um, this is the Fred Rogers Center, and we thank St. Vincent University for hosting us. But on the wall in the Fred Rogers Center is a pretty powerful quote. It's easy to say, it's not my child, not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those people who see the need and respond. I consider those people heroes. How very fitting to have that on the wall out here, to recognize that uh, many of us uh, can act in ways as heroes as someone who life may be saved. Let me tell you about some things of what's happening with this hidden crisis that's creeping up on us. Because you know, a lot of times we want to ignore what's going on. And at some point we can. In 2009, drug overdoses took past auto accidents as leading cause of death for 25 to 43, the 34 year olds. And some of these are increasing among people who are uh, middle aged adults as well. Prescription painkillers involved in more overdose deaths than cocaine and heroin combined. Prescription painkillers. I mean, that's where the serious problems are coming from here. And three out of four prescription drug overdoses are caused by painkillers and opioids, of 14,800 deaths annually. Seven million individuals aged 12 or older are non medical users of prescription drugs. That's how many people are using this medication. And heroin has nearly doubled between 2007 and 2012 and is far more potent than it was. Years ago. In January, heroin laced with fentanyl caused these 22 deaths in the Pittsburgh area. This is believe was also shown up in New York. Um, last year, there was a total of 115 heroin and heroin related deaths in Elgin, Washington, Westmoreland, and Green County. You know, some of our schools around have been affected by the car, Penfield, other places where uh, these, these problems have been occurred are, are all obviously a serious, serious concern for us. Uh, <coughs> Nearly all prescription drugs involved in overdoses are originally prescribed by a physician rather than, for example, being stolen from the pharmacy. This is real important to keep in mind that it starts with what a doctor may make and these the orders of what to do. But the quantity of prescription painkillers sold at pharmacies, look at this, and doctor's office is four times larger than it was 13 years ago, 10 years. It's amazing how much that has grown. Uh, where you see oxycontin and fentanyl and uh, lycopin and uh, some of the new hydrocodone, all those things growing. Most prescription painkillers are prescribed by primary care and internal medicine doctors and dentists, not specialists. This is important. Uh, so it is different if an anesthesiologist who specializes in pain management and who's very well tuned to what, is half what can happen with a quick uh, aspect of this is illustrated. Uh, roughly 20% of prescribers prescribe 80% of all prescription painkillers. 
and what we don't know, and I don't know, and I'm sure this data is available, is are, are there an even smaller portion, maybe 5% prescribed, a substantial amount of that too. Uh, interesting quote here from the New England Journal of Medicine. It has become clear that the risk of opioid overdose is correlated with the quantity of these drugs being prescribed in this new model. Physicians, dentists, and nurse practitioners, rather than drug cartels and street dealers, play prominent roles in escalating drug use. Paradoxically, there are simultaneous pressures to increase opioid prescribing for the benefit of individual patients and to reduce it for the sake of public health. We must advocate for more informed prescribing. So just a little over a year ago, the devil's written, and it's important to understand that uh, it's not just uh, drug pressure selling heroin. So what we need here, uh, for example, the prescription drug monitoring program, the federal monitoring program that's out there, which can be helpful, um, but it isn't always used adequately. So many times the data that's collected are people who are, uh, or are taking this kind of prescribed medication. It's not interoperable between states. So sometimes you see people doctor shopping over here in Ohio, you go to Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, zip around, so the doctors may not know what else has been prescribed. Many times physicians and pharmacists don't have access to this data, but they need to have that access so they can find out if John Doe or Mary Smith is uh, taking too many of these things. And they need real-time data of what's happening now. Because if someone may jump from place to place to place, to quickly try and get access. Now, we sometimes will hear about a case where a physician is basically the place where people just keep going and they complain about pain and they just write prescriptions all day. Eventually, the police text them. But what happens is, there's also ways that sometimes physicians who may mean well are not asking a lot of questions or prescribing. A 2008 study of medical providers in Ohio ERs found that 41% of those accessing the PDMP data altered their prescribing for patients who received multiple simultaneous painkilling prescriptions. With 61% of emergency departments prescribing fewer opioids than originally planned. Even important. So when physicians have access to this information, it can make a difference. Uh, in, in those who are just trying to get more of these drugs. Now, something that's very important here in terms of where we go with, you know, with evidence-based treatment. Uh, I believe, and many believe, and some here are involved in drug treatment, I want to hear from you on this, uh, that this is not just someone who was um, uh, in a tough life or something like that, but it's a medical condition. It's a medical condition that needs to be treated in an adequate and appropriate way. Some people are more prone to become addicted to drugs than others. And there are paths, you know, like, uh, so for example, we all talk about cigarettes and causes cancer, right? Do you know what the rate of cancer that comes with someone who may be smoking cigarettes? It's not 100%, but, right? About 80% of people don't get cancer. But we still see a causal effect. Now, not everybody who takes one of these drugs, which can make drug dependence, becomes an addict. But what happens is if someone starts on that path and you don't have this information, it's jumping around, you can have serious problems. But it creates a long-term change in the brain that makes it difficult to completely withdraw. 90% uh, of persons with substance abuse disorder do not seek medical attention. And of those who could get attention, 90% can enter addiction treatment programs that did not provide evidence-based treatment. Wow. 90% of treatment. So when we look at, you know, it's common in the, in the media of actors who have died of drug overdoses, and usually when that happens, reporters will make a list of, oh, look, uh, Heath Ledger had problems. Uh, he died of six seven drugs. And Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, he went in and out of treatment. Janice Schaub, Whitney Houston, John Belushi, all these people went in and out of treatment. Did they get the right treatment? I don't know. Well, we recognize a lot of times they don't have the right evidence-based treatment. Tell you a little story. So a few years ago, 2005, I'm in Iraq. And um, going from place to place, our vehicle, an armored vehicle, I'm there. Uh, another vehicle is coming at us in the road, the Irish Road, headed towards the airport, a place known for IEDs and attacks. Uh, I'm in the back, I didn't see. I just take off my helmet, just take off my flak jacket. Um, I didn't see this, but two soldiers in front driving, and uh, one guy yells, impact or something like that. All of a sudden, um, we're off. We hear boom, boom, and we're up in the air, and we come down hard, and we roll over. Now I'm bouncing around like a piece of popcorn there, smack my head against something. I have a concussion on the days, I don't know where I am, what's going on, seeing stars. And I do a quick, you know, this is my medical background. Toes, work, ankles, work, legs, work, hips, work, arms, arms, 
and hello, and another worker. So I was paralyzed in the street. And uh, so quickly, other vehicles came over, other soldiers came over. I'm like, what the is going on? You know, I'm talking like a sailor right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm there, people are, our vehicles upside down, they're pulling people out. I can't, I'm scared to death because I figure I've got a neck injury because my arms are paralyzed. So I'm helped out of there. We go to a vehicle, I'm putting a neck brace, all these other things, off to an ambulance, off to a helicopter, off to um, uh, flight it over to uh, Baghdad. Um, my feeling is coming back, I'm terrible tingling, the pain is tremendous. They're popping morphine into me without me even asking. So we're giving me some morphine. I don't really want morphine. We're giving it to you. I don't want morphine. Morphine, you know, you still feel the pain, but you don't care. Uh, and so they're doing all kinds of other things. I'm still, they said, you know, we're concerned. You might have uh, cut your spinal cord or something. They're going to fly you off to land schools to Mexico with a lot. I'm putting a C-17 aircraft filled with all kinds of other wounded soldiers. Uh, it's like a mobile ICU. We go to a land stool, and every time I start to have a breakthrough of pain, they give me some more. <clears throat> so I get to land stool, they do their MRI, they say, You've got a concussive shock on your spinal cord and your head, and you've got a concussion too, but we're going to just send you back to the States. I go back to the States, still a lot of pain, take these pills, put these patches on you. I don't know what they are. I'm a psychologist, I'm not into these things. I said, I know I'm a lot of pain. And after two or three days, what things? Percocet, it was oxycotton, what the heck is this, fentanyl stuff? Well, I, I'm not into addictions. I'm, I'm said, uh, I know there's a risk, but I'm not taking this anymore. Anybody here a physician? So let's take this a week, okay? So I'm taking fentanyl for a week, and Percocet, things like that. I just said, I'm done. So what didn't happen to me? It was a mess. I'm sitting in the movie theater, and I'm thinking, holy cow, what's wrong with me? And, uh, you know, so my body had already begun to adapt to fentanyl. Pretty quick. These are pretty good sized patches. So when people talk about that, that sensation of crawling out of your skin, that's what it felt like. So I'm say, I'm not a good actor. I'm not, I, don't, I hate drugs, and I get people to throw these painkillers around without explanations. And that's in the military or civilian field or anything else. This is still going on. Now, what happens if someone else says, "Hey, I'm very the pain is breaking through. I'm going to take more. I'm going to take more," and on it goes. So, but what happens? I just did it myself. Um, the basement kind of thing. So that, that's what it was. So let's talk about this. I mean, I mean, let's look at what's happened in the communities here. First of all, let me ask this. Who came from a distance greater than 10 miles from here? Whoa, my gosh. 20 miles? 30 miles? About 40 miles? 50 miles? <laughs> 50 miles? Why, where are you from? Shippensburg. Why did you come so far? Important to you? So you're from a facility, you work at a facility? My mic is any bit. Who else came from all this? Where'd you come from? I'm from the south of Pittsburgh Bridge. Came from Bridgeville. And why'd you come all this way? I have a very large practice. I'm a psychiatrist specializing in addiction and recruiting. I have patients from all over the place. They come to need help and you have to have some access. So, so you're a psychiatrist in South Pacific, and your patients have control getting help? Getting access to treatment. Getting access to treatment. Who else came along this? Which you come From where? Uh, Harrisburg. Harrisburg. Oh, you came. Tell us who you are. I'm Gary Tennyson, the Secretary of the Department of Alcohol. Thank you for coming here. You're the Secretary of the Department of Drug and Alcohol. Thank you. Working in terms of treatment room? Nice. It's nice to so many people. I mean, how many people here involved in treatment? And doing, giving treatment of uh, How many people here are here because they have a family or friend concern? Uh, someone who's been involved. Wow. Okay. So I'd like to start off with that level. I'd like to start off with the level of maybe people can tell us uh, the concerns they have within the community, maybe from that personal level. Um, uh, a family member, a friend, we don't, please don't tell us the whole story, but we do want to hear, and I'm sorry about the feedback, I don't know what you do, but please take this as well. I'm not scratching my back. Is it working any better? Yeah. Anyways, so what I want to find out from you in terms of uh, what motivates you to be concerned about this. Who can talk from a level? I mean, I've got a quote from Satan's Army. Tell us, stand up. 
Okay, um, you're okay. Carl, tell them tell uh, who you are and what Sage's are. I am Quinn Proposi, and I lost my son Sage to a heroin overdose um, March 5th, 2012. I started a group called Sage's Army, and um, we are all about awareness, bringing awareness to this issue, and we're dealing with it. We're not done. Um, you know, just going on with this stuff. You know, the kids saw it, you know. There's so much more to do. I, you know, I just got done speaking at West uh, WCCC and I'm all over the map right now, but um, we got kids out there dying. We got parents dying. Um, my son hated this disease. Um, you know, we have doctors who are over prescribing people. Um, they're the worst things. You know, Channel 4 News, you know, they paid a reporter to follow a doctor to Colorado to, uh, because he goes and buys weed. They paid a doctor, or they paid a, a reporter to go to Colorado and follow this doctor. And they could be three minutes. And he did this big segment on him and paid a reporter. That's crazy. You know, we have drugs. You know, one drug isn't better than the other. They're all the same. I'd like to say in short, but I'll People will come, I'll come back to you on this thing. Did anybody else who could share a little bit of a personal story if you want, which I'm just like, you're okay with that? Yes, I am. Uh, my Lisa. name is Lisa Coffins Wright. I live in Rockford, Pennsylvania. I had one child, my only son. I forced him through graduation to nurse his picture. A very beautiful young man. And two months later, he died. <coughs> probably one of the first of the fentanyl uh, morphine overdoses. And since then we've been doing the same thing. We're getting together with other women. This woman here lost her son in the month before mine of uh, heroin that was laced with some kind of psychotic drug. And people are dying left and right in our area and I am here because I want to try to stop it. Her son has been an addict for 18 years in and out of rehab, and she's kind of put the support trying to, we're trying to bring this into our Rockwood, Somerset area. Where are you from? Same area? Somebody else want to just give us a quick picture of story? I'm Brendan Rennie. Um, I've been in recovery from heroin and alcohol addiction for about seven months, uh, primarily through the I just think that um, there needs to be a lot more support and education for the family. Um, every time I went to rehab, uh, my, my parents didn't, you know, they were at home and it was on my mother to learn all about this from Google and, you know, all the information that's available without any kind of sense of um, what information would be most helpful. And, uh, yeah, I just think that a lot could be done very quickly to just improve the resources that are available to the families. What's your first name? Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm turn up from next one. So here's a mother who's lost her son. That's your mom over there. And you are clean now for how many months? About seven. Um, obviously you've lost your son and the heart breaks for you because the other moms are too. Um, what message would you give them? That's a very good question. He's, he's staying off. I would say, go and help others. And that's what I do. Do the likewise, go and pass it forward, and don't break your mother's heart. Wow. Okay, your mama is your mama. Stay strong. That's right. Stay strong. You have a whole community behind you. Anybody else quickly? He's powerful. But I want to make this real. Mary, Mary. Um, my name is Mary Ann Music. I'm a Latrobe resident. 
I lost my son in 2006 to a heroin overdose. Um, first off, let me say, we are in the trouble. We're going to start fighting this. We are in the process of starting the reality tour here in Latrobe. It will uh, come about pretty soon, uh, hopefully. My son, he went through treatment lots of times. Nothing ever helped because the aftercare is not there. They, you can't treat somebody for 30 days. You can't treat somebody for 30 days and put them back out on the street and say, hey, you're, you're doing all right, go ahead, go about your normal life. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <coughs> Nick? Yeah. Uh, my name is Nick Garoza. I, uh, I live in uh, North Huntington. Uh, for me, uh, you know, I, I've got a lot of like criminal charges, like out there chasing the drugs, uh, you know, totally like enslaved to my, you know, the addiction. And, uh, you know, I'm clean today. I got no treatment when I was in jail. I was in jail for 18 months, no treatment, no anything. And when I came home, I was evaluated for treatment, but because I had been abstinent for 18 months, there was no program for me to get into. I uh, didn't understand addiction or anything uh, about it, so I thought that I just wouldn't pick up. And I mean, it took maybe like two months, and I was right where I picked up 18 months prior. Um, and I just see so many good people out there. I mean, we talk about the overdose and the deaths, but I think we forget about the people that like live through the overdose but are like paralyzed or uh, you know mentally disabled. Um, where the guys with felony records, you know, I can't get student loans because of felony drug charges. It's hard to find a job. And, uh, you know, we started an advocacy group called Young People in Recovery. Uh, started out in Philly, and we got a chapter in, uh, they're calling it Pittsburgh area, but we're in Greensburg. And that's like our main focus is like better job opportunities, housing, education. Because, I mean, it's a struggle to get clean alone. And then when you get clean and you just keep running into roadblock after roadblock, it just starts to get real depressing and a lot of people lose hope. I've been blessed to have a lot of people to help me along the way and like point me in the right direction. Not everybody's as fortunate as I was. Um, and I'm really happy that we're doing this today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just, just don't give up. I just celebrated a year on February 11th, and I even still today, I don't believe that I, I made it a year because I couldn't get two minutes, two seconds. And I lost so many friends, buried so many people, and like, you know, everything's not as good as it could be, but it's, I'm starting to build relationships with family and like just doing the next best thing. I mean, I do narcotics anonymous myself and like one day at a time, just for today, like that's how, I, that's how I've made it to where I am. Thank you. You deserve Thank you. a second chance. Yeah, keep going. Thank, Thank you. you. So Nick mentioned the rest of few times. Anybody here from law enforcement? So tell us about the law enforcement. What happens when you come across someone who is, uh, and you pick them up, they're in possession or something else, what's the process and does it work? Uh, typically, they'll go to jail, uh, once again, where there's no treatment. Uh, I'm a little bit different. I try to work with uh, the individuals, their attorneys in my office, in the district attorney's office, to try and get them any kind of treatment we can. But as somebody had indicated, there's no gap there. So we just need to build that up a little bit more in this, at least in the county or Western PA. So we have been thank you. So what's happened? I appreciate that. Um, what happens? The statistics are pretty big in terms of the number of people who are in our jails, county and state and federal prisons who really have an addiction problem. Now once they start getting into sales and they're victimizing people, it's another thing. I'm not saying be soft on them. But it sounds like from what you're saying, when you're abusing drugs and you're addicted, jail is not a treatment. That's not the treatment at all. That happens. Um, oh, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's only my latest slides here. Uh, for the last year, for a year, I've been uh, I'm chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Committee in Congress, of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and I was tasked in the U.S. House of Representatives to investigate all the things post Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School. The kids were killed there, and during that time, we also had the Navy Yard shooters, and we had a shooter in, in Roswell, New Mexico. Um, I mean, the list goes on. You know the history of these things. One of the statistics out there is when you mix things like schizophrenia, severe mental illness, bipolar, depression, things like that, with substance abuse, 
the rate of violence that quadruples. Now, most people with mental illness are not violent. The people who take drugs are not necessarily violent, but there are some who, uh, some medic, some drugs people take and they get pretty agitated. But it is, it's another one of those things that people get arrested and end up in treatment, they end up in jail with some, with some types of treatment. It's not the best place for them. Anybody else from law enforcement here? Chief, come on up here. You came a long way. Tell them who you are, where you're from, what your thoughts are on the law enforcement aspect. I'm, uh, I'm Chief Coleman McDonough, I'm the Chief of the Mount Lebanon uh, Police Department and retired from the uh, Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, I, I'm here because I've become tired of people dying in Mount Lebanon, uh, which is looked on as a pretty affluent, uh, peaceful community where we've had uh, like eight deaths in 18 months over those deaths. And fortunately, we got great paramedic service in, in Narcan, where we'd have a lot more people. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I'm probably going to get thrown out of the Chiefs Association, but uh, we have to try another attack other than arrest and uh, incarceration. So who's here? Um, I asked about the physicians. Are there a, like a non-psychiatrist physician and someone else in the group? Come on up here. So, So the, the statistics you saw up there in terms of the number of pres uh, prescription drugs prescribed by physicians, uh, painkillers, and that, um, what kind of warnings do you give patients when, or do you prescribe drugs like that? What kind of warnings should they, what, and sh what should physicians do? Uh, from my perspective as a clinical counselor, <coughs> I'm an addiction therapist too. Uh, let me just do a little backstory. I come from a very small town, Washington, VA. My dad was a family physician for many years. And I remember when I was a kid, he would tell me that he would see lots of people that really don't have any problems. They just had too much time on their hands. And they were getting six, eight weeks of vacation from wherever they worked. And with that time in the boardroom, became, they became uh, uh, symptomatic of things that were, that were bothering them. But, uh, or were impairing them. And as a physician, you know, he would refuse to prescribe uh, certain medications, and I would ask him why. And he said, because these things are bad for you. Now we're talking about the 1950s and 60s. He already knew of the potential for addiction. And that's certainly before the literature. But for me as a clinician, what I see is that, and I have a passion for teenagers, and one of the big privileges is boredom. There's not enough programs for the kids to participate in. And they tend to sit around, and especially in the winter months, and get the seasonal blues, and they tend to experiment. So what I tell teens is that no matter how much that society says it's okay and it's legal, and I know that it's all natural, blah blah blah, so it's poison ivy. But uh, to not get started, and uh, because they don't know the dangers of this, and here of course heroin has become designer for them, and it's not like the old drugs of the. 60s kind of hippie era, uh, now it's fashionable. And if you're a kid in school today and you don't see a pot, you look down on it. And so the message that they get every day from their peers, who of course are their geniuses that they follow, is that uh, it's, it's not cool to not do drugs. And what also surprises me is the number of practitioners. For example, my son had to get his wisdom teeth out in the first oral surgeon was saying, okay, we'll get him a uh, liquid valium when we start the procedure, then we'll give him uh, 50 milligrams of oxycontin to take home with him and have a refill on that three times. And I said, well, he didn't even get his teeth out yet. And uh, so we refused to go that route, went to a different practitioner who prescribed bags of frozen peas. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're talking about some of the things the answer. We'll get to some of the treatment things too, but 